guys, I know that you know that I, I have names and I've always, I always considered the name of my sermon a very, very important thing. I changed this name uh, quite a bit uh, this week. And then my images, like the graphics that go with it, for some reason I care about too. You know, I don't, I don't know why. I don't, maybe there's other people that, that don't care about these things, but maybe you do. Maybe that's the reason you're even in this church. It's sort of like if Eric didn't care about his sermon titles and his sermon images, I wouldn't be here. I mean, who knows? There could be something like that. But isn't that a great image? Uh, the cover image for this is just, it, it is so delightful. And what I want to say, of course, if you're getting this via podcast, this is a challenging one for you, right? Uh, but that's Christianity right there, right there. It's pouring rain and you have a guy who's worshiping, singing in the midst of it. Now, I, I can recognize, I can feel this moment in a certain way. I don't know if you guys remember when we would get our monsoons. It's funny because Colorado's an arid climate. And yet we go back 14 years when Ellerslie started. And for whatever reason, Colorado decides to have this monsoon season. And it was right in the summertime, right in the middle of our summer semester. And it was July 4th, I remember when it started. And we had a flash flood that hit Colorado. And I had just preached that day on, you know, building your house upon the rock. And when the winds and the rains come crashing against it, you know, it will stand. And so I made some big declaration, I will not be moved. It was a big, you know, it was back in the day when I would shout at the top of my lungs too. And, you know, I might do it still. Don't, don't think that, you know, I'm past uh, that. I still can come back to those days. And that day, my, my basement floods. On the day I make this big declaration that when the winds and the rains, rains beat against my house, and that happened, okay? And so I got up the guts to reference that story. It was like a week or two later. And then so I said it again. I'm not going to be intimidated because I had made this declaration I will not be moved. And I was moved. <laughs> my attitude in that basement when I was watching the water gush in onto my carpet uh, was not a pleasant experience, right? And so I was a bit moved and I wasn't overly impressed with my response. You ever had that afterwards? You're like, okay, that wasn't very good. Uh, you don't want to tell other people that. You just want to think it yourself and say, God, could you deal with that? We need to do this better next time. So, well, I got that next time a couple of weeks later and I made this sort of, uh, you know, repeat performance of my sermon and I declared I will not be moved and we had a flash flood that day and my basement flooded. I mean, this, this genuinely happened, guys. And uh, I, don't, I don't know that I want to brag about my second response either, as if it was tremendous. But I am going to have the strangest year of my life. It was the first year of Ellerslie. All hell is coming against this ministry. And I'm, you know, I don't even know how to interpret what was taking place with the water thing, the, the monsoons. But I had six floods in my house in that first year of Ellerslie, six. And they were all following when I would declare the reference to those previous sermons. I mean, this, this genuinely happened. I know we have witnesses here that could testify this actually happened. So it was the last monsoon, because then we, we decided to switch to some different ways, like the discharge of the washing machine that we had just moved, where the guy had said, yeah, it's ready to go. And so I turned it on, we left for church. And it flooded the upstairs and into the basement. Okay, so we had different options other than the monsoons that did flood our house. But one of the final, the final monsoon, I was outside and it was, it was ridiculous. I am watching water gushing off our roof and our, we had to redo our whole foundation because all the water was gushing back towards the house off, off our roof. So we eventually had to pour concrete way past that. And but I was outside standing there staring at this. I was trying to catch it in buckets and throw it out uh, into the lawn. And it was so fruitless. I mean, I wasn't even coming close to touching the amount of water that was gushing down like Niagara Falls on top of me. And you know what I did? This picture, this was like, I raised my hands and it was so loud <laughs> outside. I raised my hands and I shouted with a smile, I will not be moved. I trust you, Lord, even in the midst of this, it does not matter if my basement gets flooded. 
that's not my concern. My concern is that you were on the throne. And I was shouting it, I was praising, and I discovered something in that day. It's like whether or not the enemy had anything to do with that or that was God's process of walking me through a filtering process. Like, how you doing, Eric? Are you, are you moved? It seems like you were a little moved there. To the point of, I will not be moved because my confidence doesn't rest in the fact that my basement is without water which by the way is a very difficult thing for me to have water in my basement. I do not like that. I don't like the idea of mold. Have you guys ever had that thought? I don't like that thought. And so to yield to God and just say, you know what? I trust you. And to have a song in my heart that is ready and fitting to the moment, to have it come out even in the rain. So here's a question for all of you. What is your position? Boy, that was rather pathetic on your part. Uh, it was a question. What, what is your position? Okay, that was a little better. I, I should have warmed you up. I'm about to ask you a question. I expect at least a little audience interaction, at least from some of you, right? I should have warmed you up. So your position is in Christ. That is a understood biblical position that the scriptures is going to lead us to when we have faith in Christ, we are by definition, according to Paul the apostle, in Christ. So I'm going to go through a few different illustrations to sort of enunciate what it means to be in Christ. Just sort of as a refresher, you know, most of you in here, if not all of you, are very familiar with the idea of being in Christ because we talk about it a lot at Ellerslie. But imagine that you were in a race. Okay, there's a starting line. And the devil, you know, you have to beat the devil in your life. You know, the power of sin has controlled you. And, you know, you read scripture and it says you need to beat, you know, the devil. You need to beat sin. It's like, okay. And so the devil, who is right next to you, the power of sin, is on his black steed, his racehorse, just happens to be the, you know, some like Arabian stallion. It's rated the fastest, uh, you know, animal on earth. You know, one of those types of things. And you get the news report that morning. And you, what do you have? You have your two legs. And, you know, but you have a, a big heart, right? But no matter how hard you try, you just can't quite pull it off. Oh, I should probably read it. You must outpace the devil on his black racehorse. Go! Now, what's interesting is many of us actually do try, and we try with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength to beat the devil. We do. The power of sin is like, I will defeat you. So here's the question I ask a lot at Ellerslie. What's in your pockets? You see, this is what you have to draw from. This is your resource. This is what you can muster. So bring it. What, what, what do you have to bring to the table? Let, let's sort of see what the odds are here. And you bring out your lint and you stick it on the table. And meanwhile, the devil just has you beat. No matter what you try and conjure up inside of you, whatever you try and retrieve out of your own willpower, your grit and your determination, it cannot succeed against that which you are up against. That's called the bad news. And it's a very real thing that we need to understand and swallow is that we can't pull this off. So what, what, what is your position? In Christ. Uh, you guys are getting better at this. So you're in Christ. So being in Christ is the equivalent of, and I had to put the pronunciation for this because I really uh, don't know that much about foreign cars, right? is the equivalent of a Remotz Nevera pulling up alongside you and the door opening and Jesus saying, get inside. Now, some of you are like, I have no idea what that is either. So that makes me feel a little better. So I'll give you a picture of it. Whoo, the Croatian cannonball. The Croatian cannonball, zero to 60 in 1.7 seconds. It's irrational. Think about this, guys. It's irrational to concern yourself with the speed of the devil's steed when you are in this thing. Now, when you're in Christ, I'm saying this is the equivalent because this is nothing compared to Christ, right? However, I'm giving you a mental picture to recognize that this race that you have been trying to run in your own strength, you need help. And so Jesus pulls up alongside you. It's probably one of those doors that goes, you know, like this. And he says, get inside. And our faith in Christ is saying, I can't do this in and of myself, but I know you can do it for me. 
And when we submit to him, it changes the race. Now, suddenly, it would be irrational for you to concern yourself with the power of sin and the ability of sin and how fast sin is in your life when you are in something so superior to sin. Okay, let's imagine that it's not a race, it's a battle. Okay, of course, it's all of these things, but it's a battle. And listen to this, guys. This is going to be a little intimidating at first. I need to forewarn you. You must overcome the devil with his myriad of terrible clubs, swords, bows and arrows, and axes. Go! So, uh, what's in your pockets? Here you are. You have your hands, you know, your arm, your elbow. You could take them on with your elbow. You know, your right ear. You could try and swipe them with your right ear. You could yell at them. Maybe that would scare them away. You don't have much here, guys. You know, you can come up and try and box the enemy, but when he comes at you with an ax, it's not a fair battle. And so in and of yourself, you're going to go down. And I think that's what we all sort of know, and or at least we've experienced, is that the power of sin when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat beats us every time. So that's why I need to ask this question. What's your position? You're in Christ. That's very different than you taking your own fists and attempting to take on the power of the devil. So being in Christ is the equivalent of an M1 Abrams military tank pulling up alongside you, the hatch opening and Jesus saying, get inside. So for those of you that don't know what an M1 Abrams military tank is, you see, this is going to suddenly make the devil's club, his bow and arrow, his axe seem rather pathetic, especially when you swing that big gun at him. So this is the indestructible armor, 68 tons, armed with an M68 gun. I don't know if there's some kind of parallel there, but you know, you've heard of an M16. This is an M68, covered with virtually un unpenetrable composite armor. Now think about this, guys. It's irrational to concern yourself with the devil's array of weapons, which he has them. He has a lot of weapons, don't get me wrong, when you are riding around in this thing. So if you actually know your position, it is irrational to fear the enemy's armor. It's irrational to fear his weapons. It's irrational to fear his battle tactics because you are in something so superior to what he brings to the table. Now, in and of yourself, what the devil brings to the table is very superior to what you have, which is why you need a savior. But your savior is not an equivalent to the enemy. He is so superior to your enemy, which is where our faith comes in. It's like, I'm not going to fear. Anxiety has no place in my life when I recognize what it means to be in Jesus Christ. So let's call it the epic adventure. So we had the race, we had the battle, now we have the epic adventure. This is like a race battle all at the same time. This is a fun one, guys. You must beat the devil, zooming in his evil speedboat, that brings us back to a previous uh, sermon, from the Florida coastline to the shores of Great Britain. Go! Now, the devil just happens to have this really cool speedboat, too. Of course, it's black, right? And it probably has like a skull on the side, you know, knowing the devil, right? And it is one fast machine. And what do you have? Let's, let's check our pockets here. Uh, what do you have? Well, you have your, you know, your freestyle stroke. You have the butterfly stroke. Uh, you have the float in the water dead stroke. Because how long are you going to last like this? You got, you know, sharks uh, swirling around you. And you're going to try and make it across the Atlantic in your own strength. Meanwhile, the devil's like, ha, ha, ha. And, I mean, there's no... No, no options here. I mean, how in the world are you supposed to take this on? The devil seems so superior to you. Oh, yeah, that, but that's, that's why we need to freshly ask the question, what is your position? So being in Christ is the equivalent of a Concorde supersonic jet pulling up alongside you and the passenger door opening and Jesus saying, get inside. So there's, there's our transportation. Uh, this is very impressive. I don't think there, it, it is available as transport across the Atlantic anymore, but it's pretty cool uh, to, to learn about the Concorde jet. Uh, the ultimate way to travel. It's able to make the journey across the Atlantic in just over three hours, moving at speeds of over 
1,300 miles per hour. Now, think about this, guys. The devil in his speedboat, I mean, it's very impressive. If he never stops for gas and he goes, you know, as fast as that speedboat of his can go, it's going to take him about 40 hours, which you have to admit, that's pretty impressive. Now, he can't stop for gas in that time. I don't know where he's going to stop for gas in that time in his little speedboat. However, I'm saying even if he has some supernatural way of getting his gas tank continuously full, he's 40 hours, you're three this isn't even a competition, guys. Why are you concerned? It's irrational to concern yourself with the devil's speedboat driving prowess when you are flying to your destination in this thing. So key meditation, and it seems like I brought this meditation up possibly in my last sermon too. We can't do this. If it's a race, you take your own ability to move, your own legs to run with, your own running form. You can try and sharpen your form and you know, train with Eugene Bolt. It doesn't make any difference. You do not have the capacity in and of yourself to compete with the black steed of the devil. The power of sin will always beat you, which is why you need to submit to someone greater to do your running for you. We can't do this. We can't fight against the enemy's war tools. They're too strong for us which is why we submit to Christ and we allow him to fight our battles for us. We can't beat the enemy in this head-to-head -head competition, which is why we submit to our God who is so superior to our enemy. We can't do this without him. Christianity is based on something called humility. The entrance into that car, that tank, that plane, that Christ, as we are saying it, is in and through the action or the function of us lowering ourselves to say this in and of itself is not capable of doing what I am called to do. But God, you still intend me to accomplish it. And I believe that it can and only can be accomplished in and through me submitting to you and allowing you to work on my behalf. And that is faith. But faith is sponsored by humility. Humility is the only thing that will cause us to reflect upon ourselves and look in our own pockets and acknowledge this is insufficient. And when we're willing to acknowledge that in and of ourselves we can't, then we are ready to accept the fact that only he can. And when we get to the point where we recognize only he can and we submit to it, there's breakthrough in our life. And suddenly that strength of the enemy shrinks. Not because we, in and of our own prowess, are, have become great. It's that we have allowed God to take over our life. And comparatively to God's power, the enemy is nothing. John 15, 5, just in case you don't believe me. Uh, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. A good way of saying this is without me, you can't win that race. Without me, you'll fall in that battle. Without me, there's no way you can get to Great Britain before the enemy. But with me, watch what I will do. We can do all things with him. That's the promise. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Ephesians, I'm going to walk through Ephesians since, uh, Ephesians. since Nathan is gone, that gives me the freedom to talk about Ephesians. If Nathan's here, then I always feel like he's in the back going, no, no, that's, that's incorrect, Eric. You know, you missed something there. Uh, so since he's gone, I'm going to take full advantage of that today. The final conclusion of Ephesians, it's, we're going to see it in Ephesians 10. Paul is going to use the term finally. It, it, Paul is a, is a funny writer, you know, because sometimes finally we'll, he'll say and then two chapters can go by, you know. So, however, he's going to be using an argument the whole time through Ephesians. And he uses argumentation language throughout Ephesians. And when we get to Ephesians 6.10, he is going to go from therefore, 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 therefore to finally. And he's going to make this statement. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Okay, that's everything I've just said to you so far. 
Be strong in the, if I try and say the name of that Croatian cannonball, I won't be able to say it. That's why I had to write it down that way. Be strong in that, you'll win the race. Be strong in the M1 Abrams tank. Be strong in the Concorde. You will win this if you submit. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This is the great secret that is going to unfold through the book of Ephesians. Paul is leading us to this understanding. The next verse is going to talk about the, our battle is not against flesh and blood. And it's going to be a conclusive enunciation of the victory we have in Christ that the weapons of our warfare are mighty. That the enemy can bring his best. He can shoot his fire arrow. But our shield of faith repels all of them. Every single one of them. He has given us the victory. The question is, do we see it? Do we know it? Have we submitted to it? And are we utilizing it? So be strong in the Remots Nevera. Is that, that's a question. Is that, is that what the scriptures say? Be strong in the M1 Abrams? Be strong in the Concord? No, the scriptures say something so superior to all of those things. So you might be very impressed with the Croatian cannonball. You might be very impressed with that tank. You might be very impressed with the Concord. They do not even scratch the surface of the grandeur of what Christ has called us into. He is so superior to all of these, and that's our reality. That's our position. So let's see if we can make our way to Ephesians uh, 5, which is where our message is going to be. You see, that finally is hanging out in Ephesians 6. And so my message for you is centered in the end of Ephesians 5, before we get to the finally. So it's, you're going to see this building up of the logic of Paul as he's bringing us to that finally. So he's going to start with some basic understanding of our position. And so we are in Christ. He, Christ has conquered the grave. Christ is seated on high. Christ has chosen you or us to reveal his magnificence. So now, you know, I'm making my way all the way to, you know, chapter three already. So the very beginning of Ephesians is going to be dealing with your identity. Who are you? You see, apart from Christ, you are a child of the devil. You do not have a hope in this world. You're a Gentile too. But when you turn to Christ, you are grafted into his working, to his righteousness, to his perfection. You are adopted as his child. Your identity shifts, and now you are a believer in Christ. Your identity is found in him. No longer are you a descendant of Adam. You are a descendant of Christ. And everything changes. All things are made new. And what an amazing thing to realize. We are in Christ, who has conquered the grave, and he's seated on high. So wh what are we? We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. And Christ has chosen us as individuals and us as a corporate body through which to reveal his manifold wisdom to the heavenlies. We are his chosen revelatory vehicle. To accomplish this, Christ has revealed his great mystery. He will do this inside us, in and through us, on our behalf. His mystery. Now, in Colossians, it's going to say this mystery hidden for ages and generations, but is now revealed. It's going to, Colossians and Ephesians are going to be parallel in so much of their terminology. And in Colossians, it's going to say Christ in us. In other words, the Holy Spirit is going to make this his dwelling place. Almighty God, who is seated on high, is going to give us his life so that in and through these things known as human bodies, we can carry the light and the life and the power of the gospel into this age and generation. So then Paul is going to conclude at the end of Ephesians 3, he's going to have built up this argument. Do you realize it? Do you see what this is? that you have been given the fullness of God. And then he's going to start whipping out a whole bunch of therefores. Therefore, if this is all true, then how should we live as a result? You see, Ephesians 4 and 5 are an enunciation of the life that we live as a result of Ephesians 1 through 3. You know how many Christians have started in Ephesians chapter 4? And they hear how we are supposed to live, but they don't realize how we live it that way. It's sort of like someone saying, you need to beat the devil on his black steed. Well, if you don't read about the 
Croatian cannonball right before that, that it's pulled up alongside you, the door is open, get inside. And then it says, so you now need to beat the black steed in a race? It's like, well, what are you going to find out? You're going to find out very quickly that you're not fast enough. And there's a whole bunch of disillusionment that comes into the Christian life because we start in chapter four in our reasoning instead of reasoning from chapters one, two, and three. And this is where Paul is going to say, therefore, I mean, that's how chapter four is going to start. Therefore. So Paul's therefore. It's Ephesians 4.1. Paul is going to say, I say, therefore, Ephesians 4.17, I say, therefore, as a result of the first three chapters. And then in Ephesians 4, 25, 5, 1, 5, 7, 5, 17, you, therefore, as a result of this reality, this is how you are to live. So Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, and then 17 through 21. Therefore, now could you imagine trying to do this without the understanding of your position in Christ? Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given us himself for, given himself for us. And offering in a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell and aroma. Now, I have taught everything so far just to get to this point. This, is, this has been a hard-fought battle. Just to get to this scripture. Because this scripture, apart from all of that, is just sort of ridiculous. It doesn't have the context needed. And the context is rather grand uh, in this. Therefore... Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, to be honest, that entire segment of scripture is a little elusive to our understanding. I'm just going to be honest about that because it's not that we can't hear it intellectually, esteem it as the word of God and say, praise God. I mean, we could even say amen after Eric reads it. And yet if I said, okay, go and do that. Uh, well, I'm not exactly sure what any of it means. And I would say, I totally get that, which is why I've spent my whole week on this particular passage going, okay, God, I have read this over and over and over again. I think it's high time I just sort of plant my roots and, and sort of stare at this for a while and say, God, I, I want to sort of understand what this means. Now, I, I get it. Like, therefore, do not be unwise, okay? It's not that I don't understand the English there. Do not be unwise, yes, amen. I don't want to be unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine. Well, I don't even like wine, so it's pretty easy, Right? In which is dissipation. Well, I don't want dissipation. I'll explain what that is in just a second. But be filled with the Spirit. Okay, I'm following him so far, guys. I'm right there with him. I'm in stride. And then he sort of goes off into some other territory that I'm not exactly sure what to do with. Speaking to one another. It's not like speak to yourself, Eric. Speak to one another. And I'm guessing you guys are the one another. Speaking to one another in Psalms. All right, um... <clears throat> Hi, hey Brent, uh, how you doing? Psalm 23. Uh, I mean, what, what, what does that look like? What is that? So, but it's not just that. It's speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. Uh, hey, uh, Ben, uh, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise. And then you have to respond in a hymn too. And all of us are like, it, okay, is that how it works? Is that what he's talking about? So what is, there's more. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh-oh. That gets into sort of the mystical side of things. A spiritual song? What in the world is that? But there's more. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, you have to recognize what this is, guys. This is a weighty statement. Paul has been building an argument all throughout this book. And this is like a final therefore. This is like all of the weight of the book is like oozing into this little segment that is the most confusing in the entire book. 
Because this isn't how we live. This isn't the, a version of Christianity that we even can relate to. So what do we do? We either just gloss it over and say, okay, you know, it's sort of like I always joke about the holy kiss thing. It's the same thing where it's like our culture doesn't participate in something. So we just sort of move on. Nothing to see here. Let's just keep going. Because if one of you came into this church and you're like, I have a spiritual song. Well, then how are we going to respond? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, here's the microphone. What, do you, what is a spiritual song? How do I even discern a spiritual song? Is that, a, is that from the Spirit of God? I mean, I, what is a spiritual song? Now, I know I, I've grown up and I've, I've been around the charismatic side and the Pentecostal side, so it's not that I can't use my imagination, and I know there's certain people that could just come up and say, I'll tell you what a spiritual song is. It's just that in the context of the body of Christ in its functionality, what does it look like? Is our communication in song? Is that how we communicate with one another? And so that was one of my big questions because I was like, okay, I'm going to stare at this scripture as if it's the word of God. As if God is talking to me right now and he's like, Eric, do you really want to know? Yeah, well, I do. I'm sort of scared of what you might say, but yes, I do want to know. I do want to understand this. So let's break down this, this segment of scripture, wise or unwise. So remember at the very beginning, it talked about, it says, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. So that seems to be the basis of how you're approaching. You're going one way or the other with your life. You're either going in the unwise direction, or you're going in the wise direction. So there are two very clear directions you can go. Unwise, so in this entire frame of, of scripture, in between the very beginning of chapter five and where we're at at the end of chapter five, it's going to actually describe what the unwise is. And it's going to say that they are ignorant of what the will of the Lord is. They are filled with intoxicating wine. Now that's going to be contrasted with someone who knows what the will of the Lord is and someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit. They uh, are given over to fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, and idolatry. This is the fool. This is the unwise. And Paul, in his argument, is building up to the point and saying, we do not go in this direction. You've been given everything to actually go in a different direction from this. So let's look at the wise. They are understanding of what the will of the Lord is. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, guys, I know, in contrast to all of this horrible stuff like fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness, we have the strangest list. And we speak to one another in psalms. We speak to one another in hymns. We speak to one another in spiritual songs. We sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. And we're giving thanks always for all things, submitting to one another in the fear of God. There's the church of Jesus Christ and our functionality right there. And I, I get it, guys, if you're just a little, like, you can esteem it, you can acknowledge it, you can say amen. That doesn't mean I know exactly what to do as a result of that. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So this word for dissipation, which is not a word we typically use, uh, asotia. So do not be drunk with wine in which is asotia, but be filled with the Spirit. So the way that, I mean, it happens in Hebrew and Greek, if you stick that alpha uh, in front of a word, it means the opposite. And so this is a word that is actually a very good word, but then we put the alpha in, which makes it the negative version of it. And so we are supposed to be, if I could say it this way, sotia, even though the word is sozo. And yet when you put that alpha in front of it, it actually empties out the value of what we are called to be as believers. What we are called to be is God's creation. And this is the opposite. Do not be drunk with wine in which is the opposite of what God created you for. He did not create you to be filled with something that inebriates and takes you away from a clarity of understanding of who he is. 
He created you to be filled with his life, his spirit. And so when there's a counterfeit, with the, which the enemy is always baiting us towards, it actually will destroy our life as opposed to establish our life. So asotia and sozo. So that word asotia is actually the, the A with the sozo, and we say it as osotia in the Greek. And sozo, this is the key of every key decision of every human, which direction you're going to go. And so God is giving us his wisdom here. You need to live in an understanding way of the will of the Lord. Isn't this interesting to think? I mean, because we can go in Thessalonians and the argument in Thessalonians actually makes more sense to me, which is still profoundly challenging to comprehend. And that is that we rejoice always. We pray without ceasing and we give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You want to know the will of God? There it is. Now this is a parallel. What we see in Ephesians is a parallel with that. Same writer, he's going to say something very similar in Colossians. And even though it doesn't totally jive with the way we think, because when we think of Psalms, we think of David's writings in the Old Testament. When we think of hymns, we think of our hymns that we sing in church. But we're taking old words and we're trying to make sense of them. Or we're translating Greek words in a way that we can understand it. As opposed to going back to what is Paul saying though? And if I could enunciate it before we even get any further, remember that picture at the very front of that man who's standing in the rain and he's worshiping? That's it. You see, that's what we share with one another. This is what we're conveying to each other. We are exhorting one another with a constancy of thankfulness and joy. That's how we are sharing. That's how we are communicating with one another. There is hope. Don't go down in the dumps the way the world is trying to take you to say the church is at its end. Look how weak it is, but look how strong our Lord is. Do you not realize who he is, that he still sits on, enthroned on high, that all things are beneath his feet, that he has a plan, that he has not forsaken his church, that he, we are still the vehicle of revelation. We are still his chosen ones through which to showcase his life, his power, his gospel. We are supposed to exhort one another with that sort of a psalm, which is a statement of truth. We're supposed to exhort with that sort of a hymn, which is a statement of praise. You see, music is perfectly fine to integrate into it, it's, but it does not have to have music to be a hymn or a psalm. It's just that we, when we think of a psalm or a hymn or worship, think about that, immediately have a melody line with it. And so we sometimes trip over these things instead of recognizing that we are carriers of this grand truth. So he says, share it with one another. Share that praise. When the rain starts dumping on your life, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give thanks. And I want you to rejoice in the midst of it. And in so doing, you will change the world in which you live. This is the will of God for us. God has given us a very simple task. I want you to triumph over darkness. I want you to triumph over every difficulty. I want you to laugh in the face of challenge. It's like anything else. Do you want me to reach the Chinese? I want you to do that and you'll reach the Chinese as a matter of course. You see, our goal is oftentimes a specific task. And God says, you're missing the will of God. The wise understand and know the will of God. I've already revealed that to you. I want you to rejoice always. I want you to pray without ceasing. And I want you to give thanks in all things. Yeah, 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 God, but can we move on to the specific task you have for me? That is the specific task. Because if you do that, the other things will begin to flow as a natural course. You will change the world around you when you stand in the rain and worship and praise. When the world sees the crushing weights on your life and they see your jubilance, they see your confidence, they see your faith, they will be impacted. That is the great weapon of warfare that he's given to us. He has clothed us in himself. He is the armor. And he says, rest there. 
You don't need to tackle all the world's problems. Let me do that. Your job is to rejoice. Your job is to believe. Your job is to worship me in the midst of the darkest moments. I will prove my power when you submit and just stay in the tank, stay in the car, stay in the Concord, stay in Christ. Let me do the great heavy lifting. Your job is to walk in agreement with my will. And when you do that, watch what your God will do. So, asotia. Remember, this is where you stick the really good word, but you negate the value of the word, you, and you cause it to mean the opposite by sticking that alpha in the front. And so I'm going to look at this as cold, dirty dishwash, cold, dirty dish water. I don't know how many of you uh, hand wash dishes. You know, I have uh, a dishwasher, but we still hand wash dishes in the Ludi house. And this goes way back. Uh, There's people in this room that know Eric uh, fairly well to know that I'm a firm believer that dishwashers are sanitizers and they're not cleaners. And so we always have to have the dishes totally clean before they go into the dishwasher. And some people are like, this guy's crazy. But as a result, I do know about things like cold, dirty dishwater, okay? There's, There's nothing worse than cold, dirty dishwater. You want it to be hot, and you want it to be clean to the degree it can be, and you want it to be sudsy. You see, some of you understand what I mean by that. Sudsy, that's, that's good, clean. You feel like it's doing something when it's sudsy. If it doesn't have any suds and it's cold and it's dirty, have you ever felt like you're just making it dirty by putting it in the water? And it's like, no, we can't use that water. We need to drain that water, which is exactly what Paul is saying. This is not talking about cleaning dishes. But he's talking about a clean life, a life that shines and sparkles. It's like, no, no, don't be filled with that. Empty that. That isn't what will give you the life. Empty that, you need the good sudsy water. So this word actually means prodigality, which is a very interesting word that we we don't use. But think about that. We know enough scripturally to recognize the prodigal. It's the one who is errant. It's the one who is mishandling the life that he has been given. The inheritance, he's been given so much, but he's misspending it. And that's actually what this word is. So do not be filled with wine, which leads to this. It means errant. You're on the wrong path. You're lost. You're broken. You're unsaved. Those are all definitions for this word. Let's contrast that with sodzo. Hot, clean, sudsy dishwater. Now, we can get something clean with that, guys. I mean, don't you get excited? Those of you that are hand washers like me, you really get excited about things like this. Have you ever had it where your stopper doesn't work very well and it always, you, know, you still leak out your water? Oh, it's frustrating. So there's a certain type of sink that is a dream for this, you know? And actually, my sink isn't a dream for this. I should have thought this through because I like those two basin sinks where you can fill up one half of it with sudsy, hot, clean dish water, and then you move it into the other side and you can rinse it over there. See, some of you understand what I mean. I just have one of those big farmhouse ones, you know, that is huge. So it takes, what, you know, an hour to fill the crate. It's like filling up a tub when you're doing it. So it's harder, okay? I'm just saying that. Uh, So if any of you are in the process of, you know, thinking about a kitchen sink, just remember that. Uh, So this is what this word means. This is what we were intended for, ironically. It means rescued, saved, made whole, healed, So it's this idea of a saving grace. It's this idea of salvation coming to us. And it's what makes us whole. This is what Jesus brings to us. And so this is what being filled with the Holy Spirit is accomplishing in us. The sozo life. I thought, you know what that sounds like? The sudsy life. Doesn't it sound like that? The sozo life? And see, see, this is where I get off on my suds and that's how I got into this little metaphor in the first place. But the sudsy life, that's what God intended us to have. Not the cold, dirty dishwater life. You see, when you engage with this world, if you are cold, dirty dishwater inside, you will have zero impact upon the world around you. But if you come in with the hot, clean, sudsy water of Christ inside of you, when you engage with this world, it impacts them. Your sparkle, when you are in the midst of that rain, when you're in the midst of the same darkness. Now, I, you know, COVID-19, you know, 2020, it'd be fascinating if we 
were to ask the question, if we were to reapproach that as the church, what would we do differently? And I know we would do things differently, I, but I think all of us are just like, let's not reapproach that. <laughs> there is something weird about that season that none of us really wants to repeat, even though we feel like it's very repeatable uh, in our modern day. But one of the things I would say is I don't feel like the church was sudsy. I feel like we played along with the dimming effects or the chilling effects of the world, which is don't be too sudsy. You'll get in trouble right now because suds are the big problem. That's what's transferring this whole thing anyways. When in actuality, our commission is to be sudsy even if it becomes illegal to be sudsy. That we can't help but be sudsy. What we have inside of us is gonna get on other people and that's just the facts. And what we have to give is not a disease. What we have to give is sozo. It's life. It's wholeness. And there's only one group that is carrying that, guys, in the entire world. And that's the believers in Jesus Christ. So if we lose our sudsiness, there's no more sudsy in this world. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So I'm gonna go through and I'll just give you a very brief understanding of each of these words in the Greek, even though this is a massively oversimplified way of doing it. And I have to admit, every single one of these could easily have the element of music interwoven into it, and it would not be incorrect. In other words, it would be incorrect for me to say this has nothing to do with music. It does have to do with music, even though I'm not exactly sure that it always has to have something to do with music. There are certain elements like making melody. Okay, that's actually how it's translated in many, many translations. So it's not like all the other translations are like, well, yeah, that doesn't actually mean making melody. That just means like making, you know, a joyful noise, which could be a shout, could be, a, but this is making melody. And a melody is, you know, it's going to undergird a song. So every single one of these, I actually see a profundity in this that our life is supposed to be a song. It is. Now, some of us don't think of ourselves as musical, which makes this even feel more odd. And yet, I believe that God is musical. I believe that God in his kingdom has something to do with song and music. And when the spirit of God moves in, he gives us songs in our heart. Now, if you ask me to explain that more than that, I'm not sure that I can yet. However, I personally understand it. Now, I am somewhat of a musician. So, and I want to say somewhat, I want to emphasize the word somewhat too. I don't I don't even classify myself as a musician, right? I'm like a hack. My grandpa called me a hack at a family reunion once. He was a musician and he heard me play for the uh, talent show. We always had a talent show for our family reunion. And uh, he came up to me afterwards and called me a hack. So obviously I still remember that. And, uh, and, but I still, I sort of think of myself that way too. Like, well, I'm not really a musician, but the God who lives inside of me is. That's sort of my, my conclusion. Some of you can identify with that, where it's just like, okay, I, I don't really feel like I have the natural talent for this, but I have the supernatural talent for it. And so let's go through each of these. Psalms, lyrical and enthusiastic statements of truth. Now, when we come together, what we're supposed to be bringing in our tote bag are psalms. Now that sounds weird because we always want to just go to the Old Testament and you know have our psalm for the day and there's nothing wrong with that those are psalms. But David, you know when he's writing these things down does he know that he's writing the scripture? I mean he had psalms. David had psalms and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so what I would say is yeah, sort of like that. They're statements of truth that oftentimes have a lyrical dimension, yes, but if you don't have the lyrical dimension, I don't think that having a statement of truth is going to be robbed just because it doesn't have the lyrical dimension. 
but to actually enunciate the beauty of what you see in his word, what you see in his creation, what you see in your relationship with God. To enunciate that and to carry it in your satchel, ready to share it with each other. Hymns, passionate and poetic statements of praise. Spiritual songs, spiritually enabled words pronounced with creative panache. To be honest, I'm, I still am a little at a loss of how to encourage that particular one. And I'm not exactly sure what it looks like when the body of Christ is functioning in agreement with the Holy Spirit, in agreement with each other, and allowing something like that to just take place. However, I want to say that it is biblical, and it's a good thing. Singing. I know this seems strange, but I'm not, you know, when we hear the word singing, we're thinking singing. And I think this could be that, but it also is simply an exclamation of honor. So it's a statement of that which is honorable, which could be encouragement to the body of Christ, right? But this is actually in a combo phrase of saying, it says, sing and make melody, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Isn't that interesting? So these next two, the singing and the making melody, is actually supposed to be done on the interior side of our life which is maybe a great way of describing rejoicing in and of itself, is that you are choosing to go up and singing just goes up. I mean, there are some depressing ballads out there, but we're not talking about those. We're talking about the triumphant annunciations of what God has accomplished, who God is, and in the midst of your darkest moment when the rain is pouring, that you are singing and making melody in your heart. So singing, exclamations of honor. Imagine something like this. And the rain is dumping on you. Lord, you are good. You are faithful. You are always true. And I trust you. See, that's an exclamation of honor. It may not even have song with it. And if all we do is start with the exclamation of honor, even if we don't have the the singing part uh, attached to it, I think it's a good place to be. If God wants to add a little singing to it, have you ever tried and made up your own song just sort of off the cuff? I've, I've tried this. My songs always sound the exact same. It's like I get one tune and then all my words sort of go with it. Let's see if I can try one. We are here today in this church and my songs that I sing to you always sound the same. It sounds sort of like Les Mis. When, when the guy's talking, you know, that type of thing. But it doesn't have a melody. It just is sort of like I'm adding some kind of sound or song to my words, but it, it doesn't sound good. Even as I'm assessing, as I'm going, it's like, God, that can't please you. <laughs> so I don't know exactly how it works to sing and make melody in my heart, but I do understand how to rejoice. That is something God has taught me. And so I am going to liken this to that since the same author is going to tell me to do the rejoicing always. And in this context, it's the same idea. And so I'm going to say, sing and making melody in my heart unto the Lord is very similar. Because you know what his next line is? And give thanks always. Which sounds very similar to rejoice always and give thanks in all things. Same author. So making melody, this is a fun one, guys, because it does mean making melody. Playing the inner instrument of the heart, soul, and mind. I've just been pondering that to think of us being all given an instrument. And yet most of us have never played it. Because when we think of an instrument, we think of like something that we hold and, you know, have either we blow into or it's a string or we play upon it with our fingers And we don't recognize that all of us were given an instrument. Now, the human voice is an instrument that all of us were given. But if you imagine your soul, or maybe it's even a spirit thing, I'm not exactly sure how I would describe it, but it's like a instrument inside of us that pleases God when we pluck it or uh, play upon it and we agree with who he is that we are singing and making melody inside. Now, my best way of describing that is giving thanks and rejoicing. That we are going up, that we are worshiping in the midst of this inner man. We're not faking it. It's a true, genuine action of our soul, and we are cherishing who our God is. And then finally, giving thanks 
always. So Colossians, you're going to see a parallel scripture here, Paul writing in Colossians, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Ephesians 5.20. So I'm just taking this one little segment out of what we looked at today. Giving thanks always for all things. So even in the rain. When that downpour of challenge, of difficulty in your life comes, that picture on the front of this message is what I want you to consider. I want that to be you. That's why I'm saying that picture is so pithy to me in my understanding of what it is we are called to. This is the will of God. The will of God is that when the rain comes, you do that. Isn't that a it's like an oversimplification of the Bible right there, the writings of Paul. It's like, you do know what to do. I've taught you well. Now entrust that to reliable men who may also be able to teach others. Te teach them what? That when the rain comes, do that. And that's an enunciation of so much doctrine in the Bible into a very practical outlet in our soul to sing and make melody in our inner man, to go up when the enemy is pushing down, to choose to reveal the kingdom of heaven. Instead of taking your woes and going to the wine, you take your woes and go to the spirit and let him play a song inside of you. And when you do that, the world will be changed. Even when it rains, we sing, we dance, we praise, we rejoice, we give thanks. Father, we acknowledge this is not something we can do apart from you. We can't beat the power of sin and selfishness that has ruled our life in head-to-head -head combat, in a head-to-head -head race. But we can in Christ. You are greater than our nemesis, than our enemy. And even though this behavior is not native to us, it is native to you. And even though our propensity is to complain and to argue and to groan and moan in a time of difficulty, Lord, your propensity is to rejoice, is to sing a song, is to articulate and enunciate truth and praise and thanksgiving. So Lord, we want to step deliberately into that behavior. We ask for this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.